Be perfect. God wants you to be perfect. Anybody perfect yet? I mean, you had like 15 minutes. What have you been doing? Did a word search of that word perfect, and, and it's a confusing word in itself, actually, which makes it so difficult to interpret. Uh, it actually is, usually Greek words uh, are a derivative of one or two roots or something like that, and you know, you get the gist. But this word perfect that's listed here is actually a derivative of like eight different words coming together. In, in the sense. This is one of the very few places it's used in Scripture at all in the Gospel here, except in John. First letter of John uses the same word perfect there. And we talked about that this morning in Sunday school. And I told you all, pay attention to that word because you're going to hear it again. Well, boom, here it is. The word actually means, <clears throat> or indicates, is indication that it means, that it is a completed process. Completed process. You know, we, we see those bumper stickers that says, I'm not perfect, but God's still working on me. Well, that's kind of half true. The not perfect is true. The God's working on you is not true because God told you to work on you, to be perfect as he already is completed and perfect. That's the meaning of I am. When God said, Moses said, who, who can I tell him sent me? I am who I am. Remember the whole Charlton Meston thing in the Ten Commandments? I am means, literally means, completed, lacking nothing. Nothing more to add, nothing more to take away. So we are to be completed or perfect as he is. So the word perfect to us means a, an act of completion. To set for ourselves, the individual, to set for themselves a definite goal and achieve through every act, every breath, literally, that, act, that goal. Both mentally and morally of character, full, filled with the spirit in, every, in, in our maturing through every labor of our life, both in mind and in effort. Wow, that's a heck of a word. God says you are to be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. Now, do you need me to read that again? Because I've already forgotten. A completed state, a completed act. The act of setting a definite goal and achieving that goal, both mentally, morally, through spiritual character, in, as we mature in every labor of our life, both in mind and in effort. That's the goal, Lord. Well, gee, that's simple. I'm sure glad he didn't make it difficult. How many of you are perfect? Let me see if I can help simplify that for you. I think perfection, at least as this word is defining, begins in a couple of steps. It's much like faith. It begins in a knowing, in a planting, in a growing or a maturing, and then an enduring. And the first direction we, like every plant that's ever planted, the first direction we've got to grow is what? Oh. Up! Except the trees over in Aruba. You ever seen those DV trees? They grow sideways. Weird trees. Of course, I can't explain a platypus either, but I digress. First thing we got to do is grow up. Now, about 20 years ago, I told you a story, and I came across that same story again this week. And I didn't even think about it until I read the story because it's gotten much bigger since then. Uh, but I did use this story a long, long time ago, and I know some of you might know it. Uh, on the Discovery Channel, they talked about Hampton Court in London. Anybody ever been to Hampton Court in London? This big, beautiful, kind of palacey sort of courtyard thing. Do you know what's in Hampton Court in London? There is a grapevine there. 
Now, 20 years ago when I talked to you, that grapevine had roots about two feet thick. Now it's got roots about five feet thick. 20 years ago when I preached that story and used it in a sermon, I told you that that vine was 1,900 feet long from its root around the court, around the court. I told you 20 years ago that that vine was not only 1,900 feet long, but it still produced some of the sweetest grapes ever tasted by anybody. 20 years have passed, and I just read a story about the amazing vine in Hampton Court. You want to know about it? Let me tell you. 20 years ago, it was 1,900 feet long. Today, it's just over a half a mile. That's 880 yards, people. 880 yards. Half mile. Anybody ever run a half mile? I used to be a track guy. I was a quarter miler. I didn't like half miles because they were like too long. Half mile. This one vine still growing. It's been in the ground for hundreds of years and it just won't, it won't die. It's like a tree unto itself, firmly planted, half mile, and it still produces some of the sweetest grapes that the English have ever tasted. <coughs> wow. You know, if I was going to call something perfect, I'd probably look at that vine and say, that's perfect. <coughs> Strong, well-rooted, un unending. Not only is it unending, it continues to grow to mature, to develop, and most importantly, to produce. It's been there 20 years ago I told you that story. And today it's huger than ever. I wonder how many of us have that same kind of priority in our spiritual lives. Think about it. I know a lot of guys back at seminary. In fact, there were seven of us that ran together. We were kind of a little clique. And I'll tell you why. Because in Asbury Seminary is a very, very evangelical holy school. I mean, whoa. God sends his angels there to learn about God. Anyway, uh, so I got there. And of course, I didn't go to Joe Blow's Bible College and Joe Blow's Bible High School and Joe Blow's Bible Grade School. And I didn't go to all those Christian Holy Trinity Saint schools and all that stuff. I went to the University of Florida, not known for its theology. So when I got to Asbury, I had two questions. I said, God, you got to be kidding. And I said, Channer, you got to play some catch-up ball here. These guys are talking about stuff. I had no clue what they were talking about. I'd never read the Bible all the way through. I'd never read the Bible that much, you know. I was interested in athletics. I was interested in ladies. I was interested in fraternity stuff. I wasn't really rooted in the Lord. So you could imagine, there were six other men at that same seminary in the exact same situation. So we, because, we became friends quickly, because, you know, birds of a feather. And we called ourselves the Unholy Seven. And we did that just to aggravate all the other kids. Well, I don't know what the Lord had in mind, but there are certain professors that are brilliant, some of the best, finest scholars in the world as to biblical interpretation, languages, antiquities, the whole nine yards. And people fight and they wait and they claw and they scratch and they, anything to get into their classes, to get under that, their tutelage. Of course, here comes Chandler not knowing squat, and I'm being the fool. It's easy for me to do. I'm being the fool in the grocery store, in the grocery line, in between two old geezers. And I even made a couple of geezer jokes. And Lord, I did not know one was Bob Lyon, Professor Bob Lyon, senior, senior professor in biblical interpretation for the New Testament. And behind me, if that wasn't bad enough, was John Oswald. 
He wrote the great history of Israel. He's the master professor, Old Testament interpreter. So I had the New Testament guy in front of me. I had the Old Testament guy behind me. And here I am making fun of old guys. Was it one of my best moments? I got you. Well, as life would have it, these guys do have a sense of humor. And before I knew it, brand new freshman, first semester there, well, I went in the summer, actually, I had to do the Greek and Hebrew thing in the summer, but when the fall started, I ended up under both of those men. I was the most hated man in Asbury Seminary. You know that thing about love your enemies? They didn't do it. <laughs> But I got three years of some of the most intensive study and scriptural invest investigation. We call it exogesis, a big fancy word that none of you know. But it just means you let the scriptures talk to you and let God in his scriptures talk to you. And you let the spirit of the Lord interpret for you what God is saying to you. It's not the other way around. Well, I think it means this. I don't care what you think it means. The question is, what did God intend? And I got put under these guys and two others like it, Robert Trana and David Coppage, for all three of my years. And that's how I buried myself in biblical interpretive classes. Everyone else, they took music and, you know, worship services and, you know, dancing, theological dancing. That's just weird. But you see, that's what I needed because I didn't come from Trinity Bible world and all these other spiritual things. And I thought about that. And I, when I left Asbury, uh, I was presented by Bob Trana, actually, Dr. Trana. He gave me a little present as we marched across, you know, and they put the garb on you and the robe and the hoods and all that stuff. And he gave me a book called the Book of Uncommon Prayer for the nutcase in the Lord. Wow, that's nice. I've read it to many of you. <laughs> the prayers out here that you're thinking, going, hmm, that's weird, Tom. Huh? Yeah. But when I graduated seminary, I realized at that moment, I don't think the whole time I was there I realized it, but when I walked out and Carol and I left, seminary and we headed to Jacksonville to take our first church here I am a rookie I was not afraid and for the first time in my life and I'm saying in my life not yours I felt firmly grounded and planted in the Lord and when we got to Jacksonville and we got to our parsonage, which was just right behind the church, which was really bad, because people were there all the time. I prayed, and I remember in my prayer, I said, Lord, now that you've planted me, you're going to have to make it grow. I don't know what to do. Well, we were there a number of years, and it was a wonderful ministry, and I started a youth group that wasn't there before, and I think when we left, it was like 83, 89 kids or something like that. Uh, they were all crazy, insane rock and roll kind of kids that wrapped themselves in duct tape and plastic bags. I didn't know what that was all about, but it was colorful. And when Carol and I filled our trailer and I drove out of the parsonage to come to here, Winter Park, these kids lined the street, every one of them. And I remember saying to Carol, I know, <laughs> she's telling me, don't tell them what, don't, don't, don't. But I remember saying, we bore some fruit here. We bore some fruit here. This is a kid right out of seminary, spent a few years trying to do this God stuff, which by all admission, I didn't have a clue of before going to that school. We got here, they put me over at the church in Winter Park, and I really enjoyed it for the first like 20 minutes. 
And then they had a conference and they voted that the Bible is no longer the word of God and wasn't a priority any longer. And something in me scared, got scared to death. And I cringed. I had even started my doctorate program in Atlanta. And they said the same thing. They said, the word of God is unimportant. I said, how do you learn about God if you don't study the word of God? Because if you don't study the word of God, all you got is the world, right? The lusts of the world. Jesus talks about that. John, this morning in Sunday school, talked about that. He said, if you are to be perfect, you need to start, plant yourself in some fertile soil. You know what that fertile soil is, folks? It's right here. It's called the Bible. That's what we call it. Basic instruction before leaving earth. The Bible. It's fertile soil. It's the only soil that's going to grow a crop of Jesus men and women. I never really appreciated seminary until after I got out of it. And I saw lives changed. And I saw young men and girls giving their life to Jesus and loving it. And when we drove away as they lined the street, I felt a little sad inside. You know, I said, gee, these are more than just strange kids. I love these guys. So I left at that church. And I left that seminary up in Atlanta, even though I'd put a year in there. And I went to TED's. I don't know if you ever heard of TED's. It's the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Very holy. You thought Asbury was holy? Ha! TED's is holy. I mean, even God goes to TED's. And I went up there to start a seven-year doctorate degree, and two of my professors were Robert Trena and John Oswald, who had left Asbury in the years that I had been in Jacksonville, and were now teaching. And they said, Mr. Chatter, are we going to have to continue with you? And I said, about seven years. Oh, woe is, he. woe is me. But they did. And I don't think I ever had a prouder moment than when they walk you across that stage. But this time there's not a bunch of kids. There's like three guys. And they put the hoods on you. And they do all that stuff. And they kneel you down and like six bishops come in and anoint you and put oil all over you. You look like a little muffin all buttered up. And they pray mightily over that idiot from the University of Florida. <coughs> the Lord said to Tom Chandler, be perfect for I am perfect. You got to be kidding, right? Everybody I ever told that I was a minister back in the fraternity and the university, I went, you're what? That doesn't make sense, Chandler. I think the start of being perfect, as God commands us to be, starts in finding the right soil to root yourself. I believe that with all my heart, not just know it with my mind. You know, you computer tech guys, that's one thing I have no knowledge of. In fact, I run to Carol, my wife, if I have any computer problems. But I know you computer guys, you got an old phrase that says garbage in, garbage out, something like that. Well, that is never more true than with the spiritual life. You got to find and root yourself in the best soil. And there's only one perfect soil in this world, and it's sitting right here. And if you do, don't be surprised if in 20 years from now, you'll find yourself growing at an alarming rate, producing incredible fruit, and you're over a half mile long. I don't know how old that vine is, but wow, what, what, a, what an illustration of life and goal setting and direction. That's what being perfect is, to set that goal and through every aspect of your being, both in thought and labor, in the sense of spiritual, moral-centered, Christ-centered character, to achieve those goals. 
and to love to achieve those goals to the point where you can even love your enemies and pray for those who would persecute you. That's the two portraits. The first one is the vine. I thought, wow, we need to plant ourselves in the right place. But there's a second one. Great story this week. Let me see if I got that guy's name. I hope I wrote it down. Uh, Mr. Darnigan. Mr. Darnigan it lives in New England. This was out of an old 60-minute report um, about six months ago. Mr. Darnigan lives in New England, and you know what Mr. Darnigan does? He is the keeper of the lighthouse. He lives alone in just what you think, a lighthouse. A little house at the bottom, and he keeps that light going. He's retiring now. For 53 years, he's kept that lighthouse going. 53 years. Great controversy here at the end of his career is not that the light went out. They asked him, has your light ever gone out? And he's, he looked at him and on the film and it's never. <laughs> How dare you even ask me that question? Anyway, his lighthouse was unique. Do you know why it was unique? And I've told some of you this before. It didn't just flash. It actually flashed in the nautical code I love you. I love you. I love you. For 53 years, mariners and sailors out in the dark sea in the storms and the waves and the threat of death all around them, they would be wondering where the shore, we don't want to crash, we don't want to run aground, we don't want, and then suddenly they'd see that, I love you. I love you. And it warmed their hearts and every sailor took great hope. 53 years, not one shipwreck, not one boat crashed, not one sailor's life lost around that lighthouse. Because old man Darnikin sat down there. Well, what, has your light ever gone out? Never. Until now. He's getting ready to retire. And the, na uh, the, the Navy decided that they're going to replace the old lighthouse with new computerized technology so they wouldn't need a Darnigan anymore. And the new one would just flash, but it wouldn't be able to say anything. And they, he said, well, no, you've got to put the message out there. The lighthouse stands for nothing. And... The Navy said, well, well we can't. We, it's too old. That technology. Nobody knows how to run it anymore. He says, you can't change that message. Well, there arose such an uproar in the New England area. All the people heard about it, rode in, rode in, protested, everything else. You can't change that lighthouse. Well, at the expense of a lot of money from the U.S. Navy, and a lot of patience from the U.S. Navy, and a lot of aggravation from Mr. Darnigan. They have, and I'm glad to say, replaced that lighthouse with technology, modern technology, guaranteed not to fail, has backup systems, everything on it. And if you're a lonely mariner out in a dark, terrible ocean, you can still see three simple words, I love you. That's the goal of Christianity right there. The portrait of the vine and the portrait of the lighthouse. One growing, living, planted firmly in the word and love of God. The other practicing everything he's known about that love of God and broadcasting it to everyone. No matter what. I wish Christians would say, well, hey, has the love of God ever gone out of you? I wish we could say, never. I'm different. Whether the world likes it or not, I'm different. I'm going to love even those who would make fun of me and criticize me, persecute me. I'm going to pray for the unlovely. I'm going to care about the, if they're out in the ocean, suffering, lost, about to crash and die. 
I'm going to say three simple words to them. I love you. Of those seven boys that hung together at Asbury way, 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 way back a long, long, long time ago, over 40 years, two of us are still in the ministry. The other five quit and left. And the two that are still in the ministry, well, their days are drawing too close. One of the other ones I heard, uh, we used to call him Stud Man because he was just beautiful. I mean, you girls would go crazy for him. And he was a little studly kind of guy. He tried to get his church to reach out to other people, build it up, you know, a little church like this one, build it up, build it up, build it up, and just no success, nothing. Nobody wanted to do anything. Nobody wanted to reach out for Christ. Nobody, just nothing. So he made him a deal. He says, if you bring a friend next Sunday, for everyone who brings a friend, and I'm not going to do this, by the way, Every one of you that brings a friend next Sunday, I will give you $100. Well, Jonathan, that was his real name. The following Sunday, Jonathan came to his church. He looked inside. The place was full. He took the first half of the church to go around and give everybody a $100 bill. That brought a friend, which was literally everybody. And then he walked up to the pulpit and he said, read these passages, and he said, this is not my church. And with that, he quit, and he resigned and walked out. You will do for $100 what you won't do for the man and the Savior that died for you. I want no part of this soil. Wow. And he never went back into the ministry. He never did. I said, Jonathan, your sin is your sin. If you uproot yourself, the world's going to do what the world's going to do, right? They're going to follow the lust of money. They're going to follow the lust of power and position. They're going to want what they're going to want, and they're going to get it no matter what they've got to do to get it. But that's not your job. Your job is to stay faithful no matter what. No matter how many winters and bitter snows and everything that comes against that vine, you've got to, your job is to keep growing. Spiritually, mentally, moral character until you achieve the goal. And everything you think and everything you derive should come from good soil, the fertile soil. And then you take what you know and you broadcast it to the world regardless of where they are in their lives. That doesn't make any difference. You know, there's a many stories in the Gospels, but there's the same ending to a lot of them. And that ending is a glorious one. You know what's said then? God flashes out His little thing. It's well done, good and faithful servant. We all so want to hear that, right? Well, God's going to ask you a question before you hear that. He's going to ask you, has your love ever gone out? Hopefully you can say, never. Then you'll hear the well done, good and faithful servant. Last thing Jesus said at the Lord's Supper was, Abide in my word and let my word abide in you, firmly rooted. Love one another as I have loved you, including your enemies. The last thing he said was, Go and bear fruit. Prove yourself, my disciple. Let us pray. Father, this morning I would pray that each of us here can begin our journeys toward perfection. That we in every aspect of our being live and work and strive for perfection. 
that our light should never go out. And that when all is said and done, we will hear those beautiful words. Well done, good and perfect servants. Enter into the rest of your Father. That's our prayer this morning, Father. Help us every way, every day, as we step further and further on that journey. In Jesus Christ, to his praise, to his glory, would we dare pray. Amen.